Hello, my name is Stefan Birner and I'm the Managing Director of NextNano GmbH based in Germany. We develop software for the simulation of optoelectronic devices. Today, I'm going to present the equations and methods that are implemented in our NextNano software and I will show you how we model, understand and optimize ultraviolet LEDs. The LED simulations were done by Maria, Takuma was working on developing the tutorials. Thomas is our expert on the non-equilibrium Green's function method, and Alex is implementing the numerical and physical equations into the software. We are a spin-off from the Walter Schottke Institute of the Technical University of Munich. The software development started already 20 years ago by several PhD students of the theoretical semiconductor physics group of Professor Peter Vogel. The company was founded eight years ago. Now we have eight employees and two locations in Munich and in Grenoble in France. We develop software for the simulation of electronic and optoelectronic semiconductor nano devices, such as LEDs and laser diodes, infrared detectors, two-dimensional electron gases, nanowires, quantum dots, and nanotransistors. We also specialize in quantum transport calculations of quantum cascade lasers and resonant tunneling diodes. Modern semiconductor devices are based on quantum effects and an accurate understanding of the physics of these devices is necessary. Our customers need an easy to use simulation tool to evaluate their design before manufacturing. Our software therefore serves as a digital twin to their experiment. We aim at an accurate treatment of the quantum physics. Our equations that are implemented are therefore very general and thus any nanostructure can be simulated. Essentially, our software answers the question, where are the electrons and which energy do they have? And we can use wave function engineering to optimize the devices. The ultraviolet spectrum can be divided into three regimes, UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVA, for instance, is not absorbed by the ozone layer and not blocked by glass or clouds. UVB causes sunburn. The hard UV radiation is absorbed by the ozone layer and the atmosphere and does not reach the Earth. UVC radiation is germicidal. That is, it's relevant for killing living bacteria and inactivating viruses. The mechanism is that the UVC photons interact with RNA and DNA and destroy it. For instance, radiation at 254 nanometers is germicidal and has the disadvantage that it's a health hazard to humans for skin and eyes. Radiation at 222 nanometers, for instance, is also germicidal but has the advantage that it does not penetrate skin. For a comparison, the band gap of aluminum nitride is around 6 electron volts at room temperature. So this is the material of choice to achieve UVC radiation in the 200 nanometer range. It has been shown that far UVC light can efficiently and safely inactivate airborne human coronaviruses in public locations. For this, a low cost and high efficiency UV radiation source at a specific wavelength is needed. The problem is that the efficiency of these UV LEDs is very low compared to standard LEDs. The wall plug efficiency is often below 1% depending on wavelength. So we need a joint collaborative effort 
to enhance the efficiency and reduce the cost to enter the mass market for these devices. Just to give you an idea about the market size for UV LEDs, it is of the order of a few hundred million dollars. The reason for the low efficiency of UV LEDs has been identified. It has to do with the polarization of the emitted photons. Light must be emitted perpendicular to the layers and not in plane of the layers to get a high extraction efficiency. So the useful light for LEDs is the one emitted perpendicular to the extraction surface. That is the ones that have a polarization vector parallel to it. We call them transverse electric polarized photons. However, to get UVC LEDs, we have to increase the aluminum content in the aluminum gallium nitride layers. Unfortunately, this increases the fraction of the transverse magnetic versus the transverse electric polarized photons. So in order to improve these devices, we have to understand the mechanism how TE and TM photons are generated. And this can be done by using a so-called K.P band structure model. So the valence bands in nitride semiconductors split into three bands. Due to spin orbit and crystal field splitting, we can call the holes heavy hole, light hole and crystal field split off hole. And the polarization of light depends on which hole band is involved in the electron to hole recombination process. The valence bands reorder versus alloy composition because in aluminum nitride the highest hole band is a different one than in gallium nitride and also the valence bands reorder because of strain. So we start with a crystal field spin orbit Hamiltonian. When we diagonalize it we obtain eigenvectors and eigenenergies. And these eigenenergies are shown as a function of alloy content. And one can see that there's a transition where the order of the three holes changes. The same figure is shown on the right, but this time the aluminum gallium nitride layer is strained with respect to the substrate. So the strain can change the energy levels dramatically. In this figure, we show the three valence band edges of aluminum gallium nitride as a function of aluminum alloy content on aluminum gallium nitride substrate having 50% aluminum. This means in this area we have a compressive strain. Here we have tensile strain. Both the strain and the alloy content is responsible for the order of the bands. On the left side, we have the gamma 9 band as the uppermost band. So we have TE polarized photons. In this regime, for high aluminum content, we have TM polarized light. As already said, only TE light can be efficiently extracted from C-oriented devices. So TM polarized photons are useless. If we had a device in this regime where we have both TE and TM polarization, we could use an M-plane oriented substrate to extract both types of photons. It also has been shown that narrower quantum waves push TM polarization towards TE and decreasing carry density helps to some degree. Every simulation starts with a strain calculation. The strain tensor components enter into this equation to determine the piezoelectric polarization. We support arbitrary crystallographic orientations to determine the piezo and pyroelectric polarization densities. 
We include second order effects and we have tutorial input files available based on a publication by Romanov. So we need a self-consistent solution of the Poisson equation, the Schrödinger equation and the drift diffusion current equations. For the Schrödinger equation, we could use, for instance, a single band model for all electron and all hole bands, or a six band model for the holes, or an eight band k.p model that includes electrons and holes in one Hamiltonian. The Poisson equation calculates the electrostatic potential from the charge density. The charge density consists of electron density, hole density, density of donors, acceptors, a fixed piezoelectric and a fixed pyroelectric charge density. The Schrödinger equation uses the electrostatic potential of the Poisson equation as an input and calculates the energy levels and the wave functions of the charge carriers. These wave functions are occupied using a Fermi-Dirac distribution to obtain the electron density. The equation here shows the single band Schrödinger equation and the single band density. The same has to be done for the whole bands. The current equations calculate the quasi Fermi levels as a function of position. We have a recombination term and a current density, and the current density is proportional to the mobility and the electron density and the gradient of the quasi Fermi level. We have the same equation also for the holes. So we need a self consistent solution of the Poisson, Schrödinger, and current equations. The nonlinear Poisson equation calculates from the charge density the electrostatic potential. The electrostatic potential enters into the Schrödinger equation where we obtain the energy levels and the wave functions. The wave functions get occupied using the quasi Fermi level and a Fermi Dirac distribution function to get the quantum density. The quantum density enters into the current equation where we calculate the quasi-Fermi energy levels. And then the whole cycle starts again and we have to iterate until we have found a converged solution, which is very challenging by the way. The self-consistent solution of the current Poisson equations and the Schrödinger equations is very time consuming. Especially the quantum solver requires most CPU time. For k dot p, we have to solve the Schrödinger equation at each point, at each k point in k space. So we have to accelerate quantum mechanics at three levels. First, the eigensolvers, then across k space, and then within the self consistent iteration. For 2D and 3D simulations, we use a preconditioned sparse eigenvalue solver such as RPEC. If we solve the Schrödinger equation for the conduction band in a single band approximation or for holes in a six band k dot p model, we are interested in calculating extremal eigenvalues at the edge of the spectrum. Here we use a spectral transformation that amplifies the extremal eigenvalues at the band edge. For 8-band k dot p, we are calculating the interior eigenvalues around the band gap. For this, we use a shift and invert method. For 1D simulations, it turns out that dense eigenvalue solvers of the LARPAC package are often faster and easier to use. The next acceleration occurs across the k-space. The k dot p model requires the eigensystem to be solved at each k-point to obtain the density and the spectra. In contrast to the single band model where we have analytical methods for the Fermi-Dirac integrals, we don't have this for k dot p, therefore numerical integration over all k-points is needed. That is, we have to explicitly calculate the eigensystem at many discrete k-points. Therefore, because this is very time consuming, we have developed 
a so-called subspace approximation. We assume that the eigenstates far away from the gamma point contribute only little to the density in the spectra. So we calculate the eigensystem explicitly only for the gamma point. Then we expand all Hamiltonians for the non-zero k vectors in the subspace of the wave functions that we obtained at the gamma point. Then we have a reduced eigenvalue problem which can be solved much faster to get the wave functions at the non-zero k vectors using the wave functions at the gamma point. Finally, we have to accelerate the self-consistent iteration between Schrödinger, Poisson and current solvers. The Poisson equation is nonlinear because the quantum density depends on the electrostatic potential. We use a predictor corrector scheme to predict changes in the quantum density upon changes in the electrostatic potential. This avoids that we have to solve the Schrödinger equation many times. Additionally, we use a subspace acceleration method. That means we calculate the wave functions of the whole system only a few times, for instance in the beginning and at the end, and in between we use a reduced eigenvalue problem to get approximate wave functions in intermediate steps. Now we discuss the layers of our far UVC LED device. It is a bottom emitter. It consists of a substrate, a low defect region, a current spreading layer, a multi-quantum weld region, an electron blocking layer, a hole injection layer, a low resistivity region consisting of a super lattice, and a p-doped ohmic contact. In our simulation, we are using the widths and the alloy compositions of a recent publication by Frank Menke. Now let's look at the emitted power spectrum. It is centered at 220 nanometers, which is in the desired UVC range. Our multi-quantum well region consists of three quantum wells for the electrons and three quantum wells for the holes. This is where the emission takes place. We can see that in this multi-quantum well region, we have both electron and hole density. So we have the desired overlap of the electrons and the holes. We can also see that we have a fourth region where we have a significant electron density. This is due to this triangular quantum well potential for the electrons, which is not a quantum well for the holes. Therefore, the hole density in this area is very small, but we have a hole injection layer where we have a significant hole density. The electron blocking layer avoids electron density in this region. So our densities look as expected. Optimization could be done in this triangular region to get these electrons back into the multi-quantum well region. Now let's look at the energy resolved densities. The upper figure shows the energy density as a function of position and energy. The lower figure shows the whole density as a function of position and energy. We can see here our multi-quantum well region with three electron quantum wells and th three whole quantum wells that are occupied with carriers. This is our triangular quantum well region for the electrons, which is not a triangular potential well for the holes. We can see the effect of the height of the electron blocking layer, which does not allow the electrons to penetrate into the right. 
This thin white line is the quasi-Fermi level for the electrons. This thin white line is the quasi-Fermi level for the holes, also seen here. The position of the Fermi level determines the occupation of the quantum mechanically calculated electron and hole eigenstates. The hole density is because this is our hole injection layer that injects the carriers from here to here. We can also see that we have no carriers at the bottom of these conduction band edges. This is because these quantum wells are very thin and the quantum well, the quantum confinement pushes the states upwards. So as we can see, simulations provide an intuitive insight into what happens in the relevant multi-quantum well region and helps to understand and optimize these important regions. So this figure looks a bit complicated. Once we have solved the k p Hamiltonian, we can plot the number of whole eigenstates, which is the x-axis, and the number of electron states, which is the y-axis. For each combination of electron to hole transition, we can calculate a transition energy. Each electron and hole state are occupied by a Fermi function. Each transition can be resolved into their spinner components, so we can tell which transition is heavy hole dominated and which transition is crystal field split of hole dominated. These momentum matrix elements are calculated for all k parallel vectors and then summed up. Taking into account the polarization of light, we can finally calculate the absorption and the emission spectrum. Once done, we can plot the absorption for transverse electric and transverse magnetic polarization and see how we can optimize the device to move from TM to TE emission. We want to mention that you can import experimental alloy and doping profiles from SIMS data into the simulator. These profiles are often complex and show fluctuations, and thus you have a more realistic model. Once you have an accurate model, you can easily add new layers or vary the doping profile to check if it improves your device. This will save you a lot of time. Now let's see what other things we can simulate. Other optoelectronic devices made from nitride semiconductors that we were investigating are quantum cascade laser type structures. We apply the non-equilibrium Green's function method, NEGF, to study the quantum transport and gain in these devices. First, we obtain the local density of states, which corresponds to the probability density of the available energy eigenstates. Next, we determine the position and energy resolved carrier density. From this, we can see population inversion and the scattering processes. Here, for instance, we have an optical transition and here we have a scattering event due to LO phonons. This model will be extended in the future to interband cascade lasers using a multiband K.P model. Once implemented, we can directly apply it to study LEDs using the NEGF method. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you want to try our software, 
please don't hesitate to contact us. Goodbye.